Welcome to this session delivered from Orkney on the closing evening of the island's annual International Science Festival. We are situated in the north of Scotland on the crossroads of great shipping routes. Over the centuries, they've brought us settlers and trade in Neolithic times and the Viking era and carried Orcadians around the world seeking opportunities. Today, we are the centre of a thriving renewables industry in which our spirit of exploration is linked to our tradition of community. And over the next 90 minutes, we're going to tell the story and hear your views. But first, to set the scene, here's the first showing of a new video completed just yesterday about Orkney tackling the challenges of climate change and the global pandemic. The video will be going live just shortly. Humanity is currently facing one of its greatest ever challenges. But it's a crisis being played out against the backdrop of something that has much more serious consequences for our planet and for all of us. Climate change. We've all had to adapt to deal with the impact of the coronavirus pandemic and now we're also feeling its economic effects. However, we urgently need to change the way we live and work long term if we are to have any hope of turning the tide on global warming. We already know that renewable energy holds the key to slowing the rate of climate change. Crucially, renewables also have the potential to drive the global economic recovery that's now needed and do it sustainably. Here in Orkney, we've worked in harmony with our natural resources for centuries. We're a small community, seen as remote by some, but we punch well above our weight in the energy world. This is our renewable story. breezy in Orkney and we've used that to our advantage for decades. We've been testing large-scale wind turbine prototypes here since the 1950s and have pioneered the concept of community turbine ownership too. Now, over 100% of Orkney's electricity demand is met from renewable generation, with the majority of that coming from wind. In addition, you'll find solar panels on lots of our homes and businesses, and a range of innovative heating systems in our public buildings. We're also learning to harvest energy from one of our greatest natural resources, our oceans. Since 2003, Orkney has been home to the European Marine Energy Centre, the world's only fully accredited open sea testing facility for wave and tidal generators. Here, wave and tidal developers can connect their devices straight into the national grid, testing in the most demanding of sea conditions. Those developers are supported by a local supply chain that possesses unrivaled experience across a wide range of specialities. And our harbour's infrastructure is world-class too. Orkney also continues to work on a variety of projects to help facilitate the development of marine renewables, spanning environmental and wildlife studies, knowledge sharing projects, and infrastructure development. Orkney's an innovative community 
and we've always sought to find practical solutions to the challenges that come hand in hand with island life. Naturally, we've applied that mindset to the field of renewables. To deal with the issue of local grid constraints, we developed a unique project that trialled taking excess energy from a community wind turbine on the island of AD, along with power generated by tidal devices at Emex Warness test site. We've been turning it into hydrogen. This was the first hydrogen to be created from tidal power in the world. This project paved the way for a number of pioneering hydrogen initiatives, which are now underway in Orkney, including powering local authority vehicles, the internal ferry fleet, and planes. We're even considering using it in the distilling process to make gin. Importantly, as the hydrogen will be generated from renewables, emitting only water and warm air, it's classed as a carbon neutral fuel. In Orkney, we believe that our renewables activity should make a positive impact on the lives of our communities. And so we're developing an integrated energy system in the islands, linking our power, transport and heat networks. The Reflex, Responsive Flexibility initiative aims to make Orkney a smart energy island, eventually eliminating the need for fossil fuels by digitally linking renewable generation with consumer demand. Consisting of a local electricity tariff and a network of technologies, including batteries, electric vehicles, chargers and hydrogen, the integrated energy system aims to balance out intermittent local renewables generation. Meanwhile, Orkney continues to set an example for the rest of the UK when it comes to electric vehicle ownership and use. We've long recognised the value of EVs, which emit no harmful carbon, while efficiently getting us to where we need to be. Excitingly, the islands are also set to see trials of electric planes in the near future. Economically, all of this renewables activity is hugely important for our islands, supporting hundreds of high quality jobs. Equally significant is our burgeoning knowledge economy, in the town of Strumness, you'll find the Orkney Research and Innovation Campus, an international centre of excellence and learning for academic institutions, businesses and organisations working within the renewables and research fields. This green revolution hasn't happened by chance though. For over 20 years, the Orkney Renewable Energy Forum, ORF, has been helping drive local renewables activity providing a key focus and voice for all those with an interest in the sector. Those are just some of the highlights from Orkney's renewable story, with many more chapters yet to be written. We're fiercely proud of our clean energy track record in Orkney and our status as a global centre of excellence for renewables research, innovation and development, and as a living laboratory. But we don't jealously guard our knowledge. We've achieved much, and it's all come through collaboration. Now, as the world faces its greatest threat, we believe the Orkney Way could hold the key to building a more sustainable future for humanity, while driving a green economic boom in the process. Well, now we've set the scene, it's time to meet two people who are going to guide us through the story of Orkney's community energy developments. 
They are both board members of Orkney Renewable Energy Forum, and the first one is Rebecca Ford. She's a final year PhD student with the University of the Highlands and Islands. Her research looks at the impact of marine renewable energy in Orkney, focusing on the relationship between language, community, energy and environment. Thanks, Harry. And with us too is Mark Hull, who has been supporting community-focused, island-based energy programmes for more than 20 years. Since joining Community Energy Scotland, he has overseen hundreds of energy developments in communities, businesses and homes. As the organisation's Head of Innovation, he oversees local and national partnerships in a portfolio of groundbreaking community projects. He's going to tell us how Orkney's island communities became renewable energy generators. Thanks, Becky. I think that sounds to me what makes me sound way, way too impressive and, and old. I feel old, maybe not impressive. Um, I'm just going to share my screen. So here you go. Just briefly, as a brief introduction to how all it all started, especially that um, this is really about community energy and communities doing it for themselves as a key theme throughout the whole of this session, hopefully. So, um, yeah, so Becky introduced myself. I've been very fortunate. I started as a volunteer in one of the outer islands and then supported other communities to do this in Orkney. I do this across um, nationally and, and wider, but I've been fortunate enough to stay and work in Orkney to do this. But yeah, why, why, island, why are island communities doing this? Island communities are in really often in a very good position just with resource. In Orkney, we think about when, wind and wave and tide to come. We have this idea of community power on the edge. The picture you're seeing there is the northwest coast of Hoy. It's truncated to get it into the picture, but it really shows you the power of the environment and the resource we've got around us. The wind, the wind that we're always affected by the wind and the wave. The wave stolen half the island, leaving that amazing cliff face, the highest in the UK, as you can see there. But really it really reflects the resources we have here. And this was a bit of, uh, just a small diagram that was done by local organisations, ORF and the council, estimating the power of, of, of energy in Orkney. And they estimated five gigawatt, five gigawatt of available power. This isn't just raw resource that's reasonable to get out because it's technically and, and economically possible. A lot of that's on the, in, the way, in the marine side. There's a lot we can do as communities. And that brought us to what, we, what the communities wanted from these, um, these projects, is to bring revenue, to get revenue to help our own communities to do things that we want to do ourselves. Early on, we were looking at getting grants and renewable obligation certificates. It moved on to feed-in tariff. Uh, the UK feed-in tariff and most of our projects got feed-in tariffs, but had to take out private loans to do this. Now we're in a period where we're, we're not sure, and we have to see what's coming. But even these projects have started to stack up on their own. And very importantly, I would say, is community will. You really, these are not small tasks to undertake, anything we're doing here. And you really need that community will to want to do it. And for where islands, a lot of the wills come out of the need. We all suffer depopulation um, to quite a high degree. We talk about absolute depopulation, especially in the outer isles. We talk about demographic depopulation. It's almost like an apple core. We have the situation that folk leave when they've gone between 16 and 20. We're lucky if we get them back in their 40s. And folk leave the islands to be near healthcare in their 50s and 60s and end up with um, high levels of depopulation. Fuel poverty, and, and it's very recognised across um, um, Scotland, the level of heating fuel poverty. Orkney, sadly, is the worst in the country, but also transport. We're on the wrong end of a very long supply chain. And skill shortage and underemployment. We don't tend to have that much unemployment in islands because often as you'll know yourselves, un unemployment, if you're unemployed, you leave. It just adds feeds into the depopulation. We have lots of folk then who stay and only have half a job or have a, a poor, poor rewarding job. And we used to talk about doing it for sustainability, but with quite a lot of really uncertain future now, it's very much focused on resilience and how we're going to be prepared for what's coming around the next corner. And these projects that we're talking about, they do bring huge benefit to us and simply money. I mean, all the trust you'll hear about of a situation where they've created independent community controlled funds that they can use to do stuff that they want to do that other folk aren't willing to pay for. And they have plans and development plans to do this. And we also use that money, not just on its own, to bring in more money from others and use it to lever in other money. But it's also enabling competence for the same, but it's often just confidence. It's amazing, even on a small community, the skills are there, just people actually need to have the confidence to come out and do and use those skills and be able to 
um, do them. And self-determination, like we don't mean this in a, in a political sense, but I often describe it, I think a while ago, is it's, it's like having one hand on the rudder of a ship. You're not steering the ship, but you have some control on your future. And finally, it was good examples. All of us are here, I'm here, because of the examples of other folk that came before us. For Scotland, it was the earliest one of all was the island of Gear. And they, had the, they were one of the early islands to get to be able to do a community land buyout. And they, they took over their island um, and managed to bought it out, buy it out with government support. But to make it sustainable, they put up mm -hmm. the Dancing Ladies of Gear, the three, the three wind turbines. And that's, um, those, the, the, those um, um, provide revenues. And straight away, they, re they, um, they um, um, renovated all the properties on their island using the revenue from that. And later on, by 2009, others were getting in on the act. Orkney were looking to develop. Westry led the way for us and Tyree were the first ones. And back in 2009, they did it. And they did it very early on. And they've been running now for a, a good while, for nearly, nearly coming up coming just over 11 years. And it's been a very successful project, very good wind resources on the island of Westry. But by 2012, the rest of Orkney caught up. And that's us in the green on the top, but so did a lot of the country. And there's a real thing that spread across all those red uh, potential developing sites across Scotland. But in Orkney, we had Westby back in 2009. But very quickly on the heels of that, we had Rousey, Exy, West, Stronzy, Shapensy, and Hoy. Oh, Edie. Edie just came slightly later, a year later, but they, they were in the same group. And we all came forward like that. And we're quite fortunate in Orkney because the council were very brave, took a brave decision in many ways and were willing to go and, and invest in their own wind turbines to provide money across the whole of the country and it's very really unique to that. And one community had an opportunity to work with a commercial develop, developer and um, they have a 10% share in that. But this slide should, should really just show the turbine moving. It was the first day, the day that we did it. And I just, I remember sitting there and standing there and just looking up there and seeing it turning and just feeling it and just seeing, seeing it start to clock of energy and just saying, it's a revolution. I like puns, but it really was and it really felt like it. And it's been a long time. But we hadn't really got there. It had been eight years for us personally to get to that point. We were just starting. And I think that was the key thing. We did this for a reason. We've all done this. We've put up these, we're using renewable energy for our own, for what we need to do and what we want to do ourselves. And this is just an example. Recently, Rousey, uh, Rousey Agency Wire did a, an audit and a survey of what have we done and looking back over the period and a phenomenal amount of stuff we've done, a whole range. But John and others, I think, will talk about that later. But it's having the resource. It's, not, it's just some of the things I say. It's the things that you do that no one else would, would let you do or that would pay you for you to do yourself. But I just want to go back now. We had a, a lovely footage from two of the turbines back from 2012. And um, we're just going to watch those now, which is the, the islands really just experiencing where the turbines have gone up in Orkney and just speaking about it, which we did just after um, two of them have gone live. six, seven years ago, that whole idea of having community turbines was mooted as an income stream for the development trusts and as a way of um, generating an income to make the, the communities more sustainable. The best way that we felt that we could ensure that the whole community had a chance to have their say was to have a postal ballot. And of that, 75% of the people who voted were in favour of the turbine project. And Community Energy Scotland have been involved right at the beginning of the turbine project. They did a lot of their initial feasibility studies. They offered, um, which obviously helped us get through planning, but they also offered um, a people to support us. All the development trusts in Orkney that have community turbines regularly get together and you can they share their, their problems. And that's actually been really successful. No matter how much you work, <laughs> how much you put in as a, as a volunteer, you can't actually achieve a lot without money. And the turbine is going to give Sharpensey with its 300 inhabitants an income or probably conservatively £100,000 a year for the next 20 years. At the beginning of this year, we funded our out to hours ferry which runs out with the scheduled ferries timetable. So it's a little 12 person boat, but that is running at a subsidized rate. And we found that to be a real benefit to the community. And the other thing that we've done is we've bought a community minibus. And again, that's helping some of the more vulnerable folk in the community. 
the fashion year of production of the turbine has been quite amazing. It surpassed our expectations and we now know that for sure we're going to be £100,000 a year or more for the community and uh, production has been significantly better than we expected. So we've already made some payouts to community groups because I think it's really important that the community benefit is there and that they feel that benefit right away. And we know that it's around 7p every time the blades go round. So um, everybody in Chartons is really good at the seven times table. <laughs> um, we've had a tremendous support from a network of people, um, but in spite of that, I think there were times that even I thought if it, it wouldn't happen. It was too big for a small community. After all, we're only 360 residents in our island. The difficulties, I think, mostly sharpen my resolve rather than make me stop. Well, it's a support mechanism for the project, and me as a turbine development officer, it was absolutely essential. I don't think we could have done it on our own. The group working, the whole function of the community uh, panel was to give support to each group, and there was a scary uh, thing to take on a multi million pound business that we were doing. The support that we had, particularly from uh, CES, in the form of Mark Cole, the chairman. Uh, I personally believe that this wouldn't happen and we wouldn't be sitting here making this video about a successful turbine project. Well, with us now is Adrian Bird, turbine manager for Shappensey Renewables Limited and director of Shappensey Development Trust to respond to questions. And with us to put the questions is a familiar face in the Virtual Island Summit and also in parts of the north of Scotland as well, James Ellsmoor, whose achievements in creating the Island Summit have been recognised by an award from the University of the Highlands and Islands where he took a degree in Island Studies. He was UHI's Postgraduate Student of the Year for 2018 and he's UHI's Alumnus of the Year for 2020. James, over to you. Well, hi Howie, thank you for that kind introduction and uh, you're right, Orkney is a very special place for me um, with that connection through my master's program. Um, thank you, Adrian, that video was fantastic. And I just wanted to share that in the chat, um, we have been getting comments from people in Chile, in the Falkland Islands, in Nevis, in India, Indonesia, the Pacific Islands, um, right across Scotland. Um, and many more than I'm sure I've missed out. So do, do the, for those listening, do post where you're coming from. It's great to see these um, commonalities. So, so Harry, shall I jump right into questions? That would be great. Great. Uh, and for those people um, who would like to have specific questions, um, then please do send them in um, in Pathable or either in the chat or in the polls tab. Um, but firstly, Adrian, I know this was covered a little bit in the video, but one question that came in was about the opposition um, received locally and uh, how that was managed. So maybe you could talk a little bit about that what, or, or what opposition existed. Well, we had a, a number of different uh, uh, oppositions or, you know, people who didn't want the turbine to go up. It's unsightly. It's not going to work. It's a big waste of money. Um, the postal ballot made it incredibly fair, gave everyone a voice. The actual trust and decide to stick to the facts and only work with facts. And when it actually came out, when it went to planning and some of the opposition groups that came against the turbine, they hadn't been sticking to it. produced drawings which were off scale and, and, and basically just going opinions. They didn't want to have it in their island. Oh, too many turbines going up. Um, the, the key for the trust board as well is the benefits of the turbine. It's great. Oh, now, our call has uh, already suggested the huge benefits and the huge power it gives us as a community. That's the real benefit. There are times when, yes, people don't like to see turbines or electricity goods they deliver will clearly outweigh the negative effect of having a on the island. Time for one more question, James. Um, well, this is maybe a, a two part question, a continuation. Um, 
of that same one was maybe briefly you can just touch on if there were any adverse impacts from the turbines that's a question that's come up and um what the reality is there and um also just a little bit about how many households are covered and if all that energy is used locally or, or exported hopefully we have time for that okay no adverse impact at all uh, all the surveys were done with birds and tv receptions and everything absolutely fine no problem um, we don't actually supply anyone locally in the grid. We will sell off to the national grid because it's really important for us to get the best price. Okay, back to you, Harry. Adrian, thank you very much indeed. In 2012, Orkney's early innovation was leading to a growing success with communities generating renewable electricity. But the communities faced further technical challenges, as Mark will now explain. Yes, and share my screen again. <laughs> right. Yes, yeah, so as I say, it was great. We got underway with the, the turbines, and um, this was the, 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 all the turbines across Orkney, and it was, a, it was a great start. But the key thing was, and we're very grateful for the fact all of these, apart from Westry, got connected because of this new smart grid, but these new non-firm connections. And that was great because it enabled to do these turbines, which we wouldn't have managed, we wouldn't have been able to afford to, we couldn't, we'd have to reinforce all the way down through Scotland otherwise, effectively. But it was, we could do it because of the smart grid. And basically back in 2003, Orkney's grid was full for firm generators, um, generation connections, the traditional connections, where you would just connect into the grid and the grid operator takes all your energy. And if they don't take it, they'll compensate you for it. And that's a firm connection. But they couldn't do that. But what someone had the idea that there's two cables running across to the, the Scottish mainland, and they had this idea of new non-firm interchip connections. They basically said, if one of those cables fails, we'll switch you off. It means they didn't have to create, leave that capacity to guarantee we could export, but it freed up 20 megawatts on the grid. The problem was that was actually used within years. It was in one to two years that was taken up straight away. 20 megawatts were installed or were committed to. Um, so it was a great success. But that inspired the, um, the grid operators to look at another way and they did a national experiment up in Orkney. We talk about light, lighthouse islands, it really felt like that. The grid operator said, right, let's look at it more closely. We're gonna do these new A&M connections, these actively network managed connections. And they look and turn off turbines and turn them down based on local pinch points across the whole of the islands. And this is a map of Orkney. And I don't know if you can see my cursor from that point of view, but it's been divided up into zones. They identified where the weak points were on the grid you focus in, you see a number three in a square. That was a place where they knew if the cables heated up too much because too, too much current flow through it, they would sag down and they wouldn't be considered safe. So they put a measuring point in there and all the operators upstream of that would be turned down or turned off if, as that, as that, air, as that um, alarm state happened. It was a way that they could use, introduce a lot more. And again, a great success. P community and private um, developers, we had 27 megawatts extra new capacity um, very quickly uh, absorbed. It went live in um, 2009 and very quickly it got full. The challenge with it though, it was a new world. It wasn't just you can plug yourself in, do your production, take your money. We're in a situation where we're relying on estimates and the grid operator said we, we would have between three and 20% curtailment. We'd be turned down or turned off for about that much of our production. In reality, when we got underway for loads of reasons, and especially in the outer zones, it was much, much higher between 15 and 60%, that's 60% of all the production we're gonna do and all the revenue we're gonna um, generate for our turbines. For individual islands, that was really significant. I say 150 to 350,000 a year. These are all islands that have gone out and done a two million pound project and borrowed maybe a million and a half pounds a foot of banks to do this. And that threatened the financial viability of this project. It was really quite serious from that point of view. It's most nicely um, illustrated by, um, a, a, a graph done by Andy, who was on the call today, he had the bright idea and it's been, came, been called the um, iceberg graph now, because basically instead we were plotting how much we were producing every month from these turbines. And he had the brainwave of putting a line under it and plotting underneath how much we could have produced and failed to produce. And the idea then became as an iceberg, because often the iceberg gets bigger under the, under the surface. I always say, I think it's got something to do with the seagull and the colouring as well. But that was it. It was a, it was a really, really clear but stark illustration. And in that year, in 20, 2013, 2014 year, ED missed out on over a quarter of a million to a small community of generation that it could have produced. 
So what did the communities do about that? There was lots of things and a lot, we were in a fortunate position that we were enabled and we could get support. So we're looking at lots of ways that we could try and do something with this energy. If we can't export it, is there other things we can do? Can we do, do things better? We, do, we developed a lot of projects. At the same time, we're working with government and the grid to improve things. But it led to a whole lot of projects across Orkney that really created the sort of the innovative islands in lots of ways. And I'm focusing in today what we started to call demand side management. But since we've done is more commonly known as sort of flexibility projects and centering on Rousey in particular. So going back to that map of, of the grid, you can see the big green, the green dot with the T is, is imagine that's the Rousey turbine. As it works at the moment, it, it supplies its power to a measuring point, measuring point three there. And you see the power flowing down to the cable and it gets measured and how much current's flowing through it. If that goes to alarm state, the current's flowing too fast, it turns off, it turns down our turbine. It's, that's curtailment, as simple as that. We had the kind of brainwave and set a project and a, a trading subsidiary called Heat Small Orkney, where we basically, all the houses, the, our houses, our own community, our own houses became our resource. They're connected to the grid. We could put a power into them at the right time when the turbine was curtailed and soak it up before we get to the measuring point, get rid of the alarm and the turbine comes back on. Simple principle, a lot of technology had to go by behind it because to make it work, we had to time it so it did it at the right time. It, had, it, it produced, the, it let the houses take the heat and the people still hot got it when they wanted it. But we also did it when Rousey turbine benefited and not all the other ones in the, um, in the zone. But that was it, it was a very, very simple principle. It was a community led project and there's a lot we had to do. We ended up being an energy company. We had to have customer relation management tools. We had to go out and recruit and do all this sort of stuff. But we installed, the installs were completed back and went live back in March 2018, where we just started to match this intelligent demand, taking, taking heat into people's um, um, storage heaters and um, hot water cylinders at the right time to match turbine, keep the turbine producing. This has gone on now for two years and it's quite a sophisticated system. You can see it's almost like a heat map with all the, 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 um, the houses and where they're taking heat across the communities. And on the left, you'll see two traces. The top one, every green line is a curtailment incident. And on the top one, that's heat going to the bricks of a storage heater. And the next one down, it's the water temperature and hot water cylinders heating up, taking that curtailment and keeping our turbines turning, but also leaving it and storing it there for when the householders need it themselves. We were really, this was for us, we were just trying to solve a local problem, but we suddenly realized we were actually innovative and groundbreaking. It was the first local supply model like this in the UK. It's great, it works with existing systems. We're proud it's been community owned and driven and it would consider a just intervention. So socially fair, hopefully be cost effective and self-sustaining. We're now going into business usual, trying to do that. We're not there yet, but it's delivering affordable warmth and social resilience and a model for wider energy. We didn't realize how much of a model it was until um, the years passed. One of the first things that came out of this work was we got involved in a European project. We were approached that um, the SMILE project um, is a very substantial 14 million euro project and it's three island, island groups now all working together. We wanted to take what we're doing in Heat Small Orkney and do it with more modern, efficient equipment. We're using old fashioned storage heaters, hot water cylinders and try and um, future proof what we're doing. So we're working with the islands of Samso and Madeira that have their own individual issues and we'll hear a bit from Samso later on. But particularly in Orkney, we were really concerned about them tackling fuel poverty, affordable, affordable warmth with efficient heating systems, and also looking at um, transport. But I say, Rousey and the other communities are a hands-on community, and that's our turbine to the top left there. And Brian, who's on the panel as well, that's him fiddling around in a, in a turbine box, which he's often known to do. He, he's checking and putting devices in there that make the turbine intelligent so we can communicate with it. And these are other things that we just put in people's houses as part of this project, like specialist heating storage, batteries, EV chargers, hot water cylinders. Um, but that's really the projects we've been doing. Smile, Smile has been running um, and was meant to be an installation phase. And this is just before lockdown. We almost got there. Um, this is a graph of all the different types of installations we've been doing across the North Isles. And just before lockdown, we, we nearly got to 100% but there's still some other things that we're waiting and just now tidying up and getting finishing. But it's just about to go live um, operationally. Um, but I'm really keen just to go back to Heat Smile Orkney and, and hear a bit and uh, we, we, uh, there's a short video about Rousey Exe Wire and their story and what we've done with Heat Smile Orkney. I have been on the board since the inception of the trust, since we decided we would go down the road of forming a trust and having a turbine and all that. Part of the Three Island Group 
on average between 230 to 250 people uh, of various ages involved in that community. We have two subsidiaries, Rewired Limited, who are the owners of our 900 kilowatt turbine, and Heatsmart Orkney. We have a 900 kilowatt turbine up on Kingley Hill, which generates power, which we sell to the grid via the SSE. And they pay us money, which goes to rewired and when the loan and everything else has been taken care of for the month once a year we get a nice big gift from rewired and we use that money to support our communities with various projects and grant offers we try to basically make our islands as sustainable as possible so that's sort of trying to encourage people to live here so the population numbers don't dwindle too much uh, making sure that we try to get the right split which can be very difficult as we have a lot of older residents and not many in the 35 to 50 age group and it's just sort of working with the community to try to help them and do projects that they will benefit from we have a, a variety of different projects. Obviously, the one that uh, everybody wants to hear about is the Smart Army project, which is the renewable energy being, uh, when we get curtailed, that being diverted into people's heating. We were being curtailed. Initially, we were told, I believe, that the figure from Scottish and Southern Electric was going to be 8%, was going to be where maximum curtailment. It has exceeded that. I don't believe we've ever had uh, a month where we've had anything near 8%. It's always been a lot higher than that. And we've always managed to pay off the loan and everything like that, but all the same, the curtailment is quite high. And the idea is by diverting electricity when it's going to be curtailed, by diverting it into heaters, it's going to hopefully keep the turbine turning longer. It'll generate more money for us, but it's also giving the community benefits as in heating as well for their homes, which is like a secondary background heat. Because fuel poverty is so bad in Orkney generally, and on the Isles in particular, our Heat Smart Orkney project came to be a few years ago, and with government funding has got 72 properties on our three islands and elsewhere as part of the project. And what it does is it uses the marginal curtailment from our turbine, which is when the grid is full and our turbine is turning and producing power, instead of it being turned off, some of that power can be redirected into devices in people's homes. This has two wonderful results. It means that the electricity is still being sold, so therefore the profits will go to Rewired Limited and be gifted to the community by the Development Trust. But it also means that those homes that are taking part have cheaper heating in their three devices, three or however many devices they have, which is a sort of win-win. And this is a real sort of front runner project it's not happened anywhere else it has had some teething problems but it's working well now and hopefully with our partners in ces we will be able to increase it and improve it with future projects the parent council group they needed thirty-five thousand pounds to put a play park at the school and they couldn't get any money but as soon as the development trust said we would match fund any money that came in they got pretty much most of the money. So it ended up we only actually spent about a thousand pounds on that play park. We have the allotments down the pier where we've put a play park at the bottom end of that for the children down the pier to play in and any visiting children. We also have raised beds and things at the school for the children to do gardening and they grow their own produce. They use that then to make the soup that they use on the Guy Fox night and they take a bucket around for silver collection, which they then get that money for the school funds. All the projects we're trying to do are hopefully trying to get them to be that they'll be self-sustaining. And joining us now from Rousey to answer your questions is John Garson, chair of the Rousey Egglesey and Wire Development Trust and also a director of its wholly owned trading subsidiary Heat Smart Orkney. Also in Rousey is Laura Frink, Turbine Manager for Rewired Limited and also a director of Heat Smart Orkney. And joining us from the Danish island of Samsø is Jan Janssen, engineer at the Samsø Energy Academy, who manages the Samsø part of the SMILE project. So first of all, Jan, why was Samsø willing to be involved? Uh, Samsu is a small island. Uh, we are just uh, 3,700 people and um, 
we have uh, we also participate in the smile project that mark hall was uh, talking about um, and in our part we have installed a big battery um, it's uh, something like 240 kilowatt hours uh, equivalent to three tesla cars uh, we have installed it in a, in a yacht harbor, a marina, and we have also installed uh, photovoltaic uh, cells, panels. Uh, so uh, when the sailors arrive in the summertime, um, they draw electricity from uh, the battery and the PV panels. And uh, we are about, uh, let's say, 50% uh, self-sustainable in, in the marina. We use the battery as a as a buffer, so it's uh, experimental, and uh, our energy balance is very good already with renewable energy. Uh, so we are more interested in the business aspect, whether it's a good business for the municipality. The municipality owns the marina. Jan, thank you very much. And meanwhile, James and Becky have been gathering the questions. Over to you, James, first. Hi, Jan. Thank you for that um, overview. And for those people who don't know SAMSO, it's kind of a legend in the sustainable islands, renewable islands, but really being the global pioneer for, for this work. So it's great to... Um, hear from you as well. And I, I guess I'd be curious to start off with uh, one question we've received is for islands that maybe haven't um, made much progress so far with um, renewables, where, where do they start? Um, because it's not just a technical issue, it's a finance issue, it's a community issue. There's a lot of different components. So any kind of words of advice on people looking to start their communities on this, this trajectory? John, that could be one for you and Laura to follow. Yeah, well, the main thing that we did was get the backing of the community. You need to get the backing of, the, of your whole community together to get a mandate because the bigger the backing you get, the people, the other funders are willing to fund you. If you've got 80% of your community is willing to go ahead with the project, if it was only 10%, they wouldn't be very keen to fund it to the same extent. And it's, it's, it's just looking into it, research, get people on the ground that know what they're doing, speak to people that's done it in the past. Laura, is that your experience very much? It's about communication and laying a very strong community foundation at the outset. I think so. I think it's really important to do um, to listen to what the community is wanting as well. I think, yeah, make sure that you, you're delivering what they what they want otherwise it won't be a popular project i think becky's got a question that's come in for you both uh well i think it's for all three actually uh it's a question about how um, the smile project is contributing overall to orkney's energy reality oh <laughs> to our energy reality. Well, hopefully, um, maybe my next presentation will give a bit of that, Becky, um, to some degree. I think we, we, we ended up doing it because we have very local needs and requirements and drivers in our community. But what it ended up doing is setting examples, which has maybe inspired a lot bigger things. And people viewing at the whole of Orkney now, looking at seeing how they could take on their whole energy systems and look to do flexibility and balancing. And so hopefully in some ways it's been there, hopefully we've been the inspiring example for the wider work in Orkney, um, like we were inspired by other islands in the community elsewhere, like Gear and Samso. I think that's been a key thing, I think, and um, it is showing that we know at a scale, an energy scale, where we're dropping the ocean to get to net zero, but we're starting to make a difference and making people even think about how they can control, get value, and change their energy lives, I think maybe is some sort of answer. And I think we've just time for a question from James for John and Laura.
Yes, thank you. James is reflecting on. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, 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 we have we have a lot of different questions coming in. I've been trying to figure out who who suits which question. Um, but I guess just a comment that people are wondering. Obviously, your islands are not one hundred percent renewable yet. Um, what happens when the wind stops blowing? Just as a, from a more practical angle, um, how, what is the bigger picture there? Laura, you're at the sharp end when that happens. What does happen? <laughs> Um, well, the, way, the day the wind stops blowing, I'll eat my hat up here. It's, it's often more windy than it's not. Um, the, a, a better kind of, well, we have to start thinking about what happens after the, after the turbine's life um, comes to an end. So I suppose that's the next thing to look at, is whether the community want us to continue on with, a, with another project so we can keep financing whatever projects they want. Do you have a rough idea of what percentage of energy comes from the wind? I mean, are you using... Uh, fossil fuels that often for, for backup? I think Mark would probably know the Yeah, do you want me to answer that one? <laughs> yeah. the, the, the turbine, these, these turbines, and these ones we're talking about, we've done other projects and other islands do other projects, James, which are about being self-sufficient. These were projects that were meant to be revenue generating that mm -hmm. we put it into the grid um, and the community used the revenue and the funds for it. It's green, it makes us, it's decarbonizing Orkney, which is a great thing, but we sized it based on mm -hmm. this turbine mm -hmm. would cover Rousey and Eggleston wires energy needs. So a net a net production would balance out. So we should be net zero for that point. If you take like 300 kilowatt average for the, for the island's use, the turbine will produce that on average over its lifetime. So on, on the spreadsheets, we're actually net zero. But in reality, we're not. We're all using fossil fuels. We're importing them and doing all those things. Our thanks to John and Laura in Rousey and to Jan in Samsa. Now, Orkney is developing new projects. And they aim to integrate different technologies to meet an urgent need, as Mark will now tell us about. Yes, yeah, so hopefully that's, you can now see the, the, this um, final short presentation. I think we've covered a lot of it in that discussion. I think, I mean, we, we were doing these projects and we were leading um, and doing the things that we were doing. And just say, this, this is the sort of, this, the SMILE project where we've got a household where we've now got smart controllers linking into batteries, a heat pump for a good heating source and using thermal storage, using storage um, um, things like hot water to do that. And we're particularly interested in, in vehicles. When this project first started, um, we first ever matched curtailment to an electric vehicle. So there's a lot, there's a chance to do that. And if you can be basically a car, the flexibility of when you charge a car gives you a resource that you let that lets be, be people to be able to have cheap electricity, but equally matches turbines and it was exploiting that for, um, for exploiting that flexibility. Well, also with the smile project, there was a real interest amongst the EV owners and the community that they, they wanted to do more. Um, and especially try and green the outer islands to get green tourism to make a network and infrastructure. And the way we saw doing that was actually putting charges across the outer aisles in tourist to go place accommodation places to encourage people to do green tourism to get out there and do that but also as a different challenge where we had to design technology that would take every every car and every different sort of technology so these sort of things were the things that we were trying to develop and bring through for smile but at the same time that was feeding into the wider issue i said we were doing it but even other people independently were thinking about it and not got together and really applied as a collective. Um, and the, one of the things that Eileen touched on in a video that we do do well is, is getting together all the different sectors, but a lot of individuals, the councils some smarter um, startups, um, EMEC um, and other partners that came together and Aquaterra and Solo to this big project. And they, they bid into this huge, it's a 30 million euro project in the, um, to the Innovate UK. And it's to do a really big thing now from this point of view across the whole of Orkney, region-wide, we're meant to be doing this aggregated, flexible power, transport and heat all together, integrating them together and balancing them in the way that we're balancing turbines with people's homes. And it creates this whole new idea of flexibility as a service for increased local, local generation. It should, be, should provide affordable warmth. That's one of our targets to do that. Electric supply, arbitrage and wholesale balancing. We, style, we, style, we now can actually work in the energy markets with our individual flexibility we have in people's houses and their cars and create revenue that communities can benefit from and offer those sort of services. So very, very quickly, the principle of it is a triangle of the three, the three areas of power that we're talking about. And the ambition of um, Reflex is to put over 500 batteries and domestic houses and people use that in their properties. 
some bigger commercial ones, about 21 of one megawatt size. A hydrogen fuel cell, as they touched on um, as well, and balancing with the grid. And heat in people's houses, like the heat pumps that we've been doing in um, Smile. And then finally, as I say, more than 500 cars across the whole of which is now talking significant levels. We're now talking about 10% of, of a community of 20,000 being involved in, 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 and linked into this project and doing it at scale rather than just an individual island. It's a group of all 21 inhabited islands from that point of view. But also particularly of interest to us and the communities is we want to use it as a demonstrator to show a whole island solution. And we had this idea that the, the, the part of the project, this whole island demonstrator, you can see in the bottom right. All right, so, but the main offer from, the, from, the, from Reflex will be a customer offering that is run like an energy company. We're going to go out and be launching and individual customers can sign up to different services. But for tonight in particular, we wanted to focus on the point of view of what the communities were doing. We had an idea and it was working with Hoy, who we've heard mentioned a few times, but Hoy have run their own public transport and their own community transport service for a long time. And they're a typical island. They basically all live down one end, have their um, ferry ports in, in the middle and the other end, and have to run down, up and down a very long low, low uh, road. They've got their own local generation. They have a grid, but they have areas of weak grid. So we're looking to see if we could do a whole system that would end up being able to show that we can balance power and tra transport and flexibly use more of our local generation, almost like Jan was saying for Samsa, use, some, use as much as we can on our own island. And it really came out of that. And that was the Hoy project. When we started it, that was our idea, and particularly we were going to get a minibus and a wee car and some electric bikes and all the rest. And when we looked at it and when we were working with Hoy and the community and what we needed, it was apparent that the most useful thing wasn't another big bus. It was actually sort of flexible load in another way, flexible demand in a vehicle that lets us do lots of wee things. And we've gone for these seven seaters, ENV 200 and Nissans. And one of them is converted to provide wheelchair access. You can get 12 people across the two cars. And that gave Hoy the best need to fill the gap that they have on their own transport service. Brian talks a bit later about that as well. And also, interestingly, the electric, the electric bikes were dropped. And that was an interesting our community's role. The community thought about it, but also at that time, a private individual was looking about supplying that as a service. And that wasn't our role. If someone else is willing to do it, we don't need to do it. And that's great from that point of view. So it freed up the option we went and looked at, looked at ED, and ED were quite interested in the bus, but when ED got wind of it, they said, actually, yeah, no, we actually like those two cars. It's a good model, and we're doing the same there with the two ENV 200s, and it freed up more budget to also put a, a car out in Chapinsey. And the electric bikes out in Papi, one of our more remote islands, would have quite a, a small road system, but already have infrastructure and want to get people and um, having their carbon tourism and uh, resident transport. And finally, on the mainland, already we have OCTO, which is the um, community transport organisation, a social enterprise that's doing a tremendous amount on doing flexible mobility across the island. But there was opportunities and through Reflex, we created these light, lighthouse car clubs. And the idea in strongness at the campus there, we're going to have three cars that people can use in the public and the, the businesses on a day to day basis. And at Kirkwall, at the harbour, where all the boats come in from all the outer islands, we're going to have a car club and it provides the opportunity for folk not to take the car across every day now. They have an opportunity, they can book a car when they can come on, they can just come as a foot voucher, cutting down costs, cutting down carbon and energy. And there's these sort of things that really came out of a lot of the work we've done as part of this bigger project and, and the opportunity to, for our islands again to show how we can lead and demonstrate. But based on that and the particular challenges was it didn't quite go according to plan because just just as we were getting the cars out, it was a time um, across the whole of the world where we hit the coronavirus um, pandemic. And that really, really changed our plans. But I'll let uh, both Brian and Andy tell you about that on some short clips. Hopefully. Apologies, yeah. We're gonna show right now. We have a wind turbine, so we're an asset management company, and we create income streams from that by selling our electricity to electric companies who sell it on to consumers. We're wholly owned by a charity company, ED Partnership. Profits and surpluses, less any reserves, are... Are you not, are you not able to see this? Let's see. Can you guys see the screen? We can see it now. 
if you oh, just no. put it back to the start thing. We can, we can see it now, Danny. Thank you. Yeah. We have a wind turbine, so we're an asset management company, and we create income streams from that by selling our electricity to electric companies who sell it on to consumers. We're wholly owned by a charity company, ED Partnership, profits and surplus. Are you guys still seeing the screen? Yeah. Yes. Is everything, can you hear and see everything? We've just lost the audio, actually. Taylor, I think it seems to be frozen. Okay. Let's see. Okay, can you hear me now? We can hear you. That's, that looks better. Yeah. Okay. Let's see. I'm just closing and refreshing that sure. Company and we create income streams. Electricity to electric companies who sell it on to consumers. We're wholly owned by a charity company, ED Partnership. Profits and surpluses, less any reserves, are fed up to the parent company in order for them to meet their social outcomes. We tend to get around and talk to people and we heard of the Reflex project and it looked like a perfect fit for Edie. So we got involved and, and, and started asking questions to which we got some positive answers. But we realised at the time that you know, should our application be successful, that ERE wasn't the correct vehicle to drive, <laughs> forgive the pun, uh, the correct vehicle to drive it forward. <laughs> so we then contacted our parent company, ED Partnership, and said, look, guys, there's this opportunity on the horizon. If you think it's a good idea, here's the details. You pick it up and you go run with it. And uh, I'm pleased to say they did. Well, we're the ED Partnership. We've been going for 15 years now, and we raise money as a charity out into the community that will benefit the people of Edie. The idea was to get some sort of bus service on the island and of course the electric vehicles was the ideal thing because we have power you know from the turbine and it started with just the bus service but then we put our heads together and thought of lots of things that they could be used for like a school bus run, taking um, people to the shop that didn't have transport, what with the, the one van having wheelchair access, we could take people in, in a wheelchair to the shop. And we also thought it could be used for, to help with tourism, to um, pick up people from the pier, take them to the hostel. There was a, a plan to have a, like a bigger mini bus but we decided to have two smaller ones and one to take a wheelchair. So we would always say one vehicle that was on the road or available, like if your one was in for repair or be a bit more resilience, the idea was. COVID-19 hit the scene and the electric vehicles were on their way at the time, but they hadn't arrived. And so when they did get here, they hit the ground running really because we used them for food parcels, delivering meals, helping in the community to supply people with things. Yeah, they've been invaluable over this lockdown period. Yeah, the van's just in a fair bit of running around delivering the, the meals at the weekend. And like when it's all volunteers doing the job, it saves their petrol. The vans are currently being used for the school bus run, which again is, is very valuable in the community. Other community groups can also use the vans for if they want to go, they want to take the children into town for something, swimming lessons or anything like that. The school could use a van for taking, taking the children to school if they want to go to other islands for book clubs and, or even if somebody in the community was needing to go into the hospital or something like that, somebody could drive them in. That's for the the van that's fitted with the, the wheelchair ramp would be a handy thing for that would allow somebody just to get out for a spin or have them up to the shop or run or that. I think it'd be a good thing.
And now we welcome Brian Clegg, Operations Director of Hoy Energy Limited, and Andy Stennett, Managing Director of ED Renewable Energy. And oh, yeah. James and Becky oh. have been doing some question sifting. Are we? Sorry, I think we do have another video, video actually. Second video, yeah. I'm sorry. No, yeah. it's okay. I think with the technical keen. issues, there was a mix, there was a mix yeah. up. So Taylor, if you want to go ahead, we'll do the oh, other video. In that now. case, we'll have the second. <laughs> Thank you, I Howie. Up and I saw Edie. <laughs> okay, and just to confirm, you guys can see the screen now. It's black. Yes, we can see it. Yes, black. go ahead. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Oh, is an island of approximately fifty yeah. square miles and a population of approximately three hundred and seventy. Hoy Energy is the trading company for the island of Hoy Development Trust. The trust owns a local revenue generating turbine of 900 kilowatts and we use the funds that it generates to deliver important goals that our community want and need and mostly that no one else would be willing to provide, such as maintenance of the community building called the YM, training and travel bursaries for young folk and folk of all ages who want to learn new skills and we have developed, operate and maintain our own community bus and mobility service. We've been operating standard diesel buses for a number of years, but as our current rolling stock gets towards the end of its life, we wanted to make the service sustainable over the longer term. Even better if the vehicle can be powered by the electricity that we generate locally here from our own turbine. When we were given the opportunity to be the demonstration site for the grid smart and flexible whole island EV transport activities, we could see how we could both benefit. In the project, we are running two EMV 200s, one of which has been adapted for wheelchair access. Originally, we were considering more of a traditional minibus type service. But our early exploration showed that the two smaller vehicles could provide a better and more flexible service for users, as well as some non-standard community needs, shall we say. We hoped running uh, these mainly as a community public bus service, charging them at the YM, our community building, but COVID quickly changed all our plans. But the vehicles have proved in this, this situation quite a godsend. And we're not at this point sure just how soon we may go back to our old plans. The vehicles have proved absolutely invaluable, delivering hot meals for the elderly and the infirm, particularly when isolated, distribution of medical supplies between various buildings on the island and the ferries, and deliveries where necessary for um, prescriptions and over 50 square miles. That's proved to be an extremely helpful service. As a result of a recent community survey, it was discovered that a community-wide contribution to decarbonisation, a community-wide benefit from reduced energy bills, was found to be extremely important to the community as a whole. Therefore, partnering with the Reflex project and progressing the legacy project for solar generation to individual properties with utilising battery technology is hopefully going to continue to deliver success. The legacy project is a high only project which essentially aims to provide renewable generation and associated community benefit to the residents of Hoy long after the current and existing community turbine has surpassed its useful life. The plan is to attach solar PV panels to generate renewable energy and store it in lithium ion batteries on individual households on the island with the basic aim of providing a cylinder full of hot water and sufficient energy for lighting and small amounts of space heating on a daily basis. The legacy project aims to do this on a cost effective basis for a period of 25 to 30 years hence the term legacy project. How are you on mute? There we are. And now there we then, go. Here we go. Now then we've heard Brian in Hoy, Andy in Edie, question sifters, what have you got for them? 
uh, I have a question for Brian, if you could talk a bit more about the legacy project and how that is being used to address fuel poverty. Well, <clears throat> um, fuel poverty is there and I think what, whilst the legacy project is aimed and uh, targeted to, to be delivered to all uh, residents of Hoy where, where we can identify um, a um, hardship and particularly quantify uh, through the local um, services where we can actually identify fuel poverty, they will be prioritised with the legacy project. So they're, they're, they will be um, early recipients of the system um, for sure. James, this is, I can see you, you agonising, which one are you going to choose? <laughs> Well, exactly. And I think this is a particularly, um, particularly interesting one. And I'm wondering, um, a lot of people joining here are from areas such as the Caribbean that have large numbers of tourists and are looking to integrate this into their tourism uh, network. And so I'm wondering if you have any thoughts. Uh, it seems like this is more aimed at residents overall, if you have any thoughts on integrating visitors as well. Um. Well, absolutely. We, we've been involved, um, as, as you've seen through the various videos and presentations, we've, we've been involved with the, the demand side management and experimental stages all the way down, down the line over the last maybe um, almost 10 years. Um, what we did find was that on specifically within Hoy, as the 900 kilowatt turbine started to produce revenue, um, that trading and the trading surplus that was going into the community went to community projects, some of which, because it's high and because of the heritage that the island has, both for itself and Orkney wide, um, provision for that, including the transport system, always have the tourism tag. So we can, we can probably ident identify a, a number of things from bird watching seats to um, to specific um, bus schedules around busy ferries that would almost certainly always um, contain tourists, whether that's for the museums, the naval and military aspect, or bird watching for the Golden Eagles, which I hasten to add were nothing to do with our project, but they were welcome. Andy, what about ED? Tourism developments? Yes, um, certainly. Uh We've got Trevides, it's kind of a large eight mile rock in the middle of the sea, one mile wide, eight miles long, and it's kind of got a top bit, a bottom bit, middle the ferries come. The top bit's where the kind of the community shop is, uh, uh, all, um, uh, the, the hostel, the offices, and that kind of thing. So we've got kind of points, we've got plug points in e each of those three areas. Um, so you've got like a, a camping area where, where camper vans can come over there or electric vans can come over there on uh, eco-tourism and all the rest of it. So yeah, we're really well placed for tourism. Uh, if anybody wants to come visit ED and try it out, by all means give it a try. Uh, you know, but uh, but I mean, I was very interested listening to the talks tonight, uh, you know, when when when, uh, when Mark was talking about Pape, which I wasn't aware of, you know, electric vehicles, is that it's very interesting how we've got sort of on the one hand on the input side we've got flexible use of grid and supply supplying electricity to the these vehicles and so on. use of these outputs like certainly very much from my parent company EV vehicles they were less um, self-aware of maybe The connection, interesting, and I think certainly ecotourism could be a great thing. She bites, but uh, I don't think we ever we, we managed to get that going. Maybe. No, I think. Yeah, yeah. Beautiful, two beautiful, beautiful, beautiful islands to visit. <laughs> Time is catching up with us. And in fact, we're going to move to a closing session for fuller discussion. But just before we do, I'll thank Andy in Edie and I'll thank Brian in Hoy. And before we move to that final session, I think, Becky, do you think it's time for a break? 
I think we'll have a short break. Uh, we'll show a nice video with some uh, images of the islands in Orkney and uh, we'll be back in two minutes. And welcome back. And now we move into our closing session and it's a treat for us as well because we're going to bring in speakers from three islands in various parts of the world, each of whom will put a question to the Orkney group and first give us a little of their own islands perspective. And we're going first to South America, the southern tip of Patagonia, in fact, from where Umberto Vidal is going to join us. Umberto is Associate Professor at the Centre for Energy Resources at the University of Magallanes. Umberto, welcome. We're delighted you're joining us. Thank you, Howie. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Umberto Vidal. I'm the Director of the Renewable Energy Centre at the University of Magallanes. And I would like to begin uh, saying a big, big thank you to the organization for inviting me. Uh, today, I will talk to you about uh, one of our projects, uh, which support uh, low-scale farmers in, in the Tierra del Fuego island. I will share my screen. Okay, um, uh, this map uh, show part of Tierra del Fuego Island uh, with its main city Porvenir next to the Magellan Strait and the city of Punta Arenas where the University of Magallanes uh, is located. Um, as you can imagine uh, from the picture of this local tree, uh, wind is the most abundant uh, resource in this region. Uh, near Punta Arenas, there are two wind farms uh, which are operating with uh, outstanding capacity factors uh, above 54%. Uh, the smaller farm has three turbines, uh, 850 kilowatt each, and the other farm has also three turbines uh, with 3.3 megawatt of power each. Uh, I think that this large scale technology uh, will be used uh, at the Tierra del Fuego Island uh, in the near uh, future. Uh, another uh, resource of great importance uh, is the marine 
energy at the Magellan Strait. Uh, it has a great potential uh, to complement other uh, renewable energy sources uh, due to the strong tidal current, uh, which can reach over uh, four meters uh, per second uh, in some points. Um, we develop a project that uh, serve uh, small scale farmers at, of the Tierra del Fuego Island. Uh, before the project, they were filling a 5,000 liter tank uh, to water the greenhouses with an old uh, windmill. Uh, the process took four uh, hours, and if there was no wind, uh, a gasoline motor pump was uh, used, uh, which increased the operational cost. Uh, the equipment consists of three PV panels, uh, a small wind turbine, uh, one kilowatt power, and a battery set with regulators and a control panel, which were installed inside a shelter. The innovation in the pumping system is that no inverter was used and both pumps are driven by direct uh, current. Finally, uh, the system showed that the main energy source was the wind, as expected. However, the PV panels performed uh, surprisingly well. Therefore, it was uh, demonstrated that photovoltaic energy can contribute significantly. By using this wind solar hybrid technology, the time required to fill the tank was reduced from four hours to two hours and the sustainability of the farm was increased by reducing the fuel expenses. Um, I'm sure that uh, we can learn a lot of uh, the Orney Island experience. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Umberto. Would you like to put a, a question to the panel or will I just ask Mark to comment? I think Mark wants to comment and he's, I think he's seen some interesting similarities between Orkney and yourselves. I think, I'm thinking Mark's there. If Mark isn't there, I'll just briefly say, Umberto, in Orkney we get wind speeds, some really high wind speeds because we don't have so much shelter on our landscape and the wind seem to come, seems to come for a long distance across the Atlantic. Is that the same for you? You're, I think you're mute. That's it. Now you're uh, on. Uh, yes, uh, we, we have a great uh, a wind potential here uh, uh, because um, our geography is, has uh, very similarities with uh, the Orkney Island. Uh, we have also a great potential of marine energy and uh, I, I think and I believe uh, that uh, in the near future uh, uh, we're going to, to have a, a similar situation that you are living now. We're looking forward to keeping in contact. Thank you, Umberto, to, to, for joining us. And we're going to move now to the Indian Ocean and the Andaman and Nicobar Islands, where waiting for us is Ibrahim Jadwet, who is the secretary of the Nicobar Chamber of Commerce and Industries and a social entrepreneur working for chains. Hello, hello and welcome. Welcome, Ibrahim. Thank you very much. Uh, it's really a pleasure being part of this uh, group. Uh, I can see three or four et uh, people from my islands are in the audience, uh, which gives me uh, more energy to uh, speak about it. So Andaman Islands is actually uh, a group of uh, 572 islands in the Indian Ocean, and we belong to the, uh, the Indian government. It's actually a union territory. And uh, out of 572, islands. There are only uh, around 37 or 38 islands. So there's a population of all about four, roughly around 400,000 people. And, uh, and it's uh, famous for tourism. And I hope uh, all of the people listening today might uh, visit the islands once the COVID situation uh, is better. And if I talk about the energy, uh, we are not much focused on uh, wind energy, but uh, like since the 1920s, our dependency on energy is only on fuel, on generators. So we are still in the uh, the old uh, mode, but 
the government of India is actually pushing and focusing on uh, creating more renewable energy. So our uh, biggest focus is on solar. And if you see uh, in last one or two years, uh, there are works going on in different islands uh, for installation of solar panels. Uh, some of them are battery generated. And, uh, but still we are not up to the mark. So if, there's roughly around 55 uh, kilowatts uh, electricity produced here, out of which uh, 40 kilowatt are still in uh, the generator sets. So I hope this is a very good uh, session. Uh, it's actually a good learning session for me because I can uh, uh, definitely learn something in in last like in this week and go back to the islands and uh, promote more renewable uh, energy and I feel that more and more people should connect and uh, and with organizations such as uh, island innovation and uh, you know because energy is something uh, it is a basic need and we all uh, require that and we need to preserve it for a future generation so for which I feel that we need to focus on more renewable energy. And as far as uh, wind turbines are concerned, I think it's a very good idea what the islands are doing there. Uh, I feel that uh, as a social entrepreneur, in fact, I myself is looking in various opportunities such as solar and wind, and I will definitely try to connect and see if there is any scope in the Andaman Nicobar Islands. And I wanted to ask a question is, uh, what happens during rainfall if there is like heavy rains and what happens with the working system of the wind turbine and how many approximately one wind turbine how many households can it reach how many houses well there's two men here who should be able to help Ibrahim and Mark was offline briefly but now yeah sorry sorry yeah that, that's me working fine yeah so I mean you so you're just supplying just over half of you, so you still, but you still have 40 kilowatts um, as diesel gen sets, basically, um, Ibrahim, do you? I think um, as far as rain, rain doesn't affect turbines to any great degree. I mean, they, they, they are, they're waterproof and they just work fine, the most of the modern the devices we're using. And they get it, and then Ocni, they'll get it from every angle, not just some above, it'll be up and under and all the rest. We had some really interesting times, being a bit techy, that the, um, the sheds that we have all the control switching gear in, um, it's quite hard in Orkney because um, in the winter, the rain, the salty water will get in everywhere, but in the summer you get too hot and it's almost impossible to have a system which lets enough ventilation in the summer, but keeps the salt out when the wind blows. And that has been a big issue for us <laughs> as far as the rain goes. Um, but no, so that's, it's fine as far as operating those devices. I say the, the, the projects we've talked about here, they're not trying to balance their whole islands. We have other good examples of that. I mean, there's islands like Egg and other communities. And the big, I think the biggest secret, even Madeira on one of the SMILE projects, and the biggest secret is making sure you have, if you have any opportunity for storage and cheap storage, the, the batteries are getting there, but anything which is like pumped hydro or anything, I mean, Madeira incredibly is so fortunate to have water for that as well, even though it's <laughs> because of the hills in the middle. Um, but identifying that sort of storage and then, as you say, balancing it at, at, at low voltage. Carry on, sorry. And I think Brian was going to come I, I think it's a great that. opportunity. Oh, okay, mm. Ibrahim first and then Brian. So, <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes, it's, it's, it's a great it's a great opportunity it's a great opportunity and i think uh, even here uh, on my part i will definitely try to uh, talk to the people in the administration here and see if there is uh, more opportunity for the uh, the wind turbine in the andaman nicobar islands uh, because uh, we need we are focused on solar right now but i think there is also potential for wind so thank you very much for all the information Oh, thank you and for joining us, but I think soon. we would <laughs> yes, love yes. to come and visit. That's a very kind invitation. And here's Brian, who might well invite you to Hoy as well. Brian, what about the rainfall? Yeah, just just to comment quickly uh, on there. Uh, first one was the rain. Um, as Mark alluded to, generally, rain in Orkney is horizontal rather than vertically down. So uh, we deal with it in a different way. Um, but what we do get here is a lot of lightning. Um, that is something to consider um, if you've got um, severe weather systems. Um, we've we've just gone through a, a, an instance of damage on our turbine. Uh, gladly we're running again now. But light, lightning 
that's associated with rainstorm sadly is um, a bigger worry for us. Um, but the second point I wanted to make, Ibrahim, for you there, as you assess your options, um, our wind turbines are quite large. Probably the, they're the size they are, as Mark said earlier, to optimise um, the government incentive scheme, what we have, what we call the feeding tariff. Um, but as we as we mature and move forward, and these projects um, broaden um, and become uh, less experimental and more um, more practical what we're realizing is that solar now complements wind even at our line of latitude um, if it's applied correctly with intelligent control and storage um, it's it works well with wind um, even though wind is our predominant resource yeah. brian thanks for this and ibrahim thank you for joining us and your questions and we're going i to just i just wanted to add ending. something uh, yeah come a, back. Quick, a quick note uh, one of my um, a colleague, uh, who's a very senior journalist here, Zubair, he just messaged me that uh, the Nicobar Islands has already or winds over there. So I think it's a really uh, a great opportunity for us to uh, connect. And I think I'll definitely go through all the notes and files of this summit in last one week and definitely will look forward for it. We've enjoyed awesome. your company very much. Thank you. And now we're going to go through several thousand miles of cyberspace because our final destination is in the South Atlantic, out on the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. It's the island of St. Helena. And waiting for us there is Lolly Young, who's chair of the community organization SHAPE. And those letters stand for St. Helena's Active Participation in Enterprise. The organization tackles the challenge of island waste and the question of how to turn it into a resource in a social context. Hello, Lolly, and welcome. Hi, Howie. Thank you for having us. And a um, little bit different to renewable energy, but we're just glad to have this opportunity to showcase our social enterprise. I'm going to share the screen. Okay, so um, SHAPE was established in 2006 as a social enterprise. Screen up. Yes, we can Sorry. see it. Go ahead, Larry. Lolly. Okay, and um, it actually came from an, an idea in the Shetland Islands. So in 2004, there was a consultancy that um, the Australian government recognised the need to um, put disabled and vulnerable people into employment and towards independence. And so we modeled shape on the COPE Limited from the Shetland Islands. Um, as a social enterprise, we funded 70% by SHG, um, St. Helena government funding, and 30% from um, other um, fundraising donations and sale of our products. And we have between uh, 20, we have about 25 people coming to shape um, ages 18 to 65 uh, with varying disabilities and we have a number of training programs but we thought we'd just highlight tonight some of the more environmental training focuses we have on, um, on offer. Um, so some of the things we're doing is we're taking the fibers from flax and aloe and making it into um, traditional crafts and we've recently started using the leaf and weaving that and flax and aloe being both invasive species, so helping in that way. We operate a small, um, small scale processing initiative, taking the wool from the farmers in its very smelly state and then processing it into really lovely products. Um, here on the island, all of that would end in landfill. Um, it wouldn't be um, changed into anything, it would just end in the landfill. And then last year we get, began a very small a small scale plastic recycling project, making souvenirs, working with a few other small organizations on island, trying to um, prevent the uh, plastics from going into the oceans. But one of our biggest and our uh, most successful projects is around paper and card recycling. And we are the only fully operational mechanized recycling plant on island. Um, we managed to get all of this through funding from the Darwin Plus um, funding over the last years. Um, we heard people talk about um, resilient communities and the need for the local support. And that's one of the things we're really proud of about SHAPE is that we are well regarded throughout the local community. We work in um, collaboration with the community. 
Um, we have actually supported a number of our people into full-time employment. And of course, one of our successes is our very niche market in terms of paper and card recycling. And we have the opportunity to grow something really fantastic. But like small islands, we do have our challenges. And unfortunately for us, our local market still hasn't quite adapted to that local artisan handmade recycled goods. So selling our products are slow and much more slower since um, lack of visitors to the island. And one of our big challenges too is we don't have an online banking presence. Um, our banking facilities on island doesn't allow for marketing and selling off island. And then again, like all islands, we, you know, funding is always a challenge and we compete with quite a number of organizations on island trying to raise money to support their organizations and with grants and aid, because we get money from um, the UK to run our island, um, funding is always really vulnerable for us. But it's been really interesting listening to what other projects are going on out there and how other islands are combating this. Um, and we at SHAPE, we have a very positive can-do attitude and we continue to look with optimism to the future. So it was really, really wonderful to give us this opportunity to just showcase a little of what we're doing to help the environment on our small island, all those thousands of miles away from Orkney. And the fact that we've come in full circle, that we took the model from the Shet Shetland Islands and now here today. Thank you very much, Howie. Uh, that's a, that's a lovely connection, Lolly. And as you were speaking, I was thinking of the island of North Ronaldsea in Orkney, which has a population of about 60 people, native sheep, and they set up a, a small wool, wool mill to spill, spill in the wool from the sheep. And I was also just thinking about this whole idea of waste. And it's an Orcadian tradition. Any piece of wood we ever see on the beach, we cannot leave it behind. We, we, always, we always take it. So definitely turning waste or things washed ashore by the sea into a resource is, a, is an island tradition for both areas in the world. Thank you for joining us slowly. Look forward to an opportunity to, to speak further, I'm sure. And I've just been looking at the, the time and realizing that it's just about run out and there really was so much left to discuss. So could I suggest that Mark and Becky can take all the unanswered questions and see if we can arrange to send answers by email. In fact, for anyone wanting to follow up with contacts with Orkney, whether for energy links or culture or business, or of course, science festivals, you're most welcome to contact us through links in the Virtual Island Summit. It's been a great experience for us to share our stories and hear your feedback and wonderful to get feedback from three different oceans of the world. We hope for an opportunity to meet again in one island or another. In the meantime, wherever you are, by day or by night, we wish you fair weather and a fine future.